Brown was the only school of its stature that uh, offered creative writing as a major. That made it very appealing. Also, not having to ever take math again, very appealing. I thank you, Ira Magaziner, because I, I think, although we've never met, that I owe you a debt, as do most people of my particular age, uh, un unmentionable age. So I applied to Brown for that reason. I was waitlisted and ended up at Barnard College for my freshman year. And then, of course, as soon as I got into Brown, there was no more creative writing major. I had to be lumped in with the semiotics people, about which I have quite a lot to say, if you have the time. And um, I assumed everybody was smarter than I, everybody. And then, uh, very early on, I realized there were people who would say something like, hey, how you doing, wherever I went. So I was then sort of bewildered about why I hadn't gotten into Brown in the first place. Furthermore, as a transfer student, there were many people I became friends with who never let me forget that I transferred in and that I was really not as good as they. And that continues. Here's the thing, in the 70s, late 70s, when I attended Brown University, yeah, I did, I went to Brown, um, we all read such a strange canon of books. I, I think I read Wojtek in three classes, including, you know, music. I don't know, yeah, it would make sense, there was an opera Wojtek. Wojcik, Wojcik, Wojcik. You know, there are, there are certain stock conversations you have when you're away at college and you come home and you're carrying a copy of Marx or, you're car or your hair is funny or you have a new piercing or you're whatever. And this is one of them. It's just very brown. Are you learning anything? You're still not taking an economics class? Didn't I ask you to? So I read Wojcik and um, there are lots of things I don't remember from my education, but there are also lots of things I do remember. And sometimes one of those ideas or memories or uh, lessons comes back into my head and I think, thank you education. Because if you're paying attention and if you are really attending your classes at Brown and if you make the slightest bit of effort, you actually could have your head filled with ideas which will hold you in good stead for a long time. It made us a tremendous target by people from Harvard, um, Yale, and Princeton in particular, who have a lot of requirements, uh, to make themselves feel better by telling us we didn't learn anything in our college. And the lowest grade in the class... She's gonna say my name! Lisa Simpson, zero. <gasps> Lisa, <gasps> the president of Harvard would like a word with you. Nasty business, that zero. Naturally, Harvard's doors are now closed to you. But I'll pass your file along to... <clears throat> Brown. Mmm, heck of a school. Weren't you at Brown, Otto? Yep. Almost got tenure, too. <gasps> no, not Brown, Brown, Brown. We all felt a little bit lucky and, and um, maybe even a little smart for having figured out that this was a cool, great place to go to school. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. We could have gone to Yale. Oh, sure. We could have gone to Columbia or Chicago or Princeton. But we had discovered the secret, which was Brown. And it was such a secret that for many of my years there, uh, people would say, that's on Long Island, right? Or that's off New York, right? Or that's, that's near Mauritius. I don't know, people didn't know where Rhode Island was, hadn't heard of Rhode Island. I found myself having to say, you know, it is a state. The way I would say, I'm a transfer, but I, I was admitted for real, I'm legal. So uh, Brown was just um, an underdog and uh, I do remember a feeling of um, a victory when I'd find out that one of my friends had turned down Stanford or MIT. All right, all right. 
people would come home from school on vacation and say, I love brown, I love brown, or I'm going home to brown. And home was just a, an unfortunate stop between semesters of brown, the happiest place in the world, even though it rained all the time, even though people called um, milkshakes cabinets, it's still a, a very happy school for every kind of person, engineers and semioticians, whatever those are. The desirability of brown is a secret sauce and uh, no one is allergic to this sauce. That's the secret, you know, the secret is it, it did sort of provide something for everyone. It provided in, incredible academic freedom compared to any other school in 1975. There was nothing like it. There were no, there were no rules at Brown. Uh, so I think that made us feel very trusted, which in turn made us feel very heady. So at Brown, I expected um, more women professors, more just a natural co-ed uh, situation, which I found socially. Uh, I did not have a single woman professor at Brown in my three years at Brown. I think that's kind of odd, I, I sort of sad. And, you know, you don't like a professor because he's a man or she's a woman, but it was, um, it was damn noticeable not to have women professors. And it was during the Louise Lamphere um, uh, lawsuit that I attended Brown and she made me and the whole, the whole suit and kind of scandal that it revealed was uh, eye opening for me because Brown sort of got away with not having women professors for no valid reason for a long time. It was not a very girly place to go, that's for sure, and you could not refer to yourself or any one of your generation as a girl. That, was, that word was so verboten and it was almost as if you had sworn by accident in church or in a, in a job interview. You said somebody was a girl, oh, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. It was really uncomfortable to call someone a girl. And that may have been the beginning of political correctness. I graduated from Brown not only with a degree in semiotics, which I had to explain to anybody I ever interviewed with and confess I didn't really know what it was or they were, um, but I also graduated having edited something called Fresh Fruit. It was an alternative weekly and I had risen up to maybe senior editor, deputy editor, but I knew how to lay out a newspaper page, something that no one can do any longer. I knew how to um, uh, write a headline and size pictures and so on and write. And that experience, plus having a little radio show at WBRU, really, I thought, were handing me my career. And they sort of did. They made me um, confident that I would get a job in the media when I graduated and they made me certain that um, the New York media world was awaiting me. <laughs>